An elementary school teacher called on a student during math class. Maybe if I give you two rabbits plus two more rabbits, how many rabbits would you have? Wendy thought for a second and answered, five. The teacher responded, no, Wendy, listen carefully. If I give you two rabbits plus two rabbits, how many rabbits would you have? Wendy said again, five. Let's try this another way. If I give you two apples and two apples, how many apples would you have? And Wendy happily answered, four. That's right, good. Now, if I give you two rabbits plus two rabbits, how many rabbits have you got? And Wendy said, five. The teacher looked at her and said, Wendy, how on earth do you work out that when I give you two rabbits plus two more rabbits, you have five? And Wendy said, well, I've already got one rabbit at home. <laughs> Math, word problems can be tricky, especially when you don't show your work so the teacher can figure out what variables are missing or rabbits you are adding. And I'm pretty sure all of us remember having to show our work in math. Was not enough to provide a correct numerical statement showing two mathematical expressions coming out as equal. We also had to show and explain the arithmetic we used to get there. And this meant that we could have the right answer, but still be wrong in the dangerous area of showing our work. And that may not have seemed fair to our young minds, but it revealed if we knew what we were doing. And I suspect most of us don't want to do math problems at church or maybe at all on Sundays or during the week. We don't fret, there's no math test today. Indeed, it's unlikely I'll ask anyone to show their math for the church. But I, I brought math up because <clears throat> sermons are work being shown on theological questions and answers derived. Today's Lectionary reading is a case in point. Way, way back in June, I set out ideas for sermon for every Sunday, all the way through Christmas. Basically, for each Sunday, I chose a lesson from the lectionary Bible selections, and I named the topic for today. For today, I selected Psalm 66, and I wrote this brief note: "Is there cause for the world to make a joyful noise?" And I often put my sermon ideas in the form of a question because that's how I see the task before me. I lift up theological questions and then answer them, showing the work anchored in Jesus and in Scripture. Only, well, it's both simpler and more complicated than that. It's simpler in the sense that I know the answer is going to be awe, wonder, and or love. It's more complicated because not every question on a set of verses obviously leads to that answer. And so see, every time I sit down to write a sermon, it is, in a way, akin to explaining answers on math home. Okay, I know the answer, awe, wonder, and love, but how did we get there? Theology deals with lots and lots of very deep and complicated issues. But virtually all of the issues are in response to experiences of or searches for the awe and the wonder and the love that we encounter or hope to encounter in life. And I know the answer is always awe, wonder, and love because those are the basic answers Jesus gave throughout his life. And for Christians, Jesus is the decisive revelation of God. And before I go any further, I want to briefly explain what I mean by awe, wonder, and love. By awe, I mean what Webster's indicates the word means. An emotion variously combining dread, veneration, and wonder that is inspired by the sacred or sublime. And by wonder, I also mean the Webster's definition of cause of astonishment or admiration, the quality of exciting, amazed admiration, rapt attention or astonishment at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience, a feeling of doubt or uncertainty. Wonder. 
Because I am using love in the biblical sense of the word, I turn to Webster's Dictionary of Theological Terms, which defines love as strong feeling of personal affection, care, and desire for the well-being of others. It is the primary characteristic of God's nature and the supreme expression of Christian faith and action. Love. And if we admit that there is that sort of awe, wonder, and love in our lives, then that admission surely is enough all on its own for us to make a joyful noise to God, as Psalm 66 tells us. Moreover, as the psalmist goes on to assert, it is enough for the whole of the earth to make a joyful noise. Unfortunately, the psalmist shows his work, which made my effort today a little easier. But the psalmist, the psalmist starts with how we are to respond one way. Awe plus wonder plus love adds up to the response called for in the first three verses that we heard in the awesome and the response being made a joyful noise all the earth. Sing the glory of God, saying, give to God glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. And I hear that as a call to try and stop focusing so much on the hard scrabble in life and take time to look, hear, and feel the overwhelming goodness, all that awe and wonder and love. Way back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis tells us that God called absolutely all of creation from the start good. And when we take time to gain perspective and notice how very true that is, it brings us all and wonder, and a sense of well-being, and a desire for it, for the rest of creation. In Psalm 65, which I read for the invocation, ends with creation itself celebrating. Your, you crown the year with your bounty, your wagon tracks overflow with richness, the pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy, the meadows clothe themselves with flocks, the valleys deck themselves with grain, they shout and sing for joy. And that's Psalm 65, and Psalm 66, it's humanity's turn to join in and make a joyful noise to God, to say to God, how awesome are your deeds. And God's deeds include more than just making of a wonderful world. The deeds of God for us go beyond the physicality of creation. Extend to God, desiring our well being, a working toward it. God gives us hope and rescues us, and we see that in the seminal salvation story of the Hebrew texts. Psalm 66 raises up the image of Exodus, where God helps Hebrew slaves escape over the Red Sea, and unlike any earthly powers that come and go, we're told God rules forever. Listen again to verses 4 to 7. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among the mortals. He turned the sea and the dry land and passed through the river on the foot. And then we rejoiced in him. We were ruled by his might forever. Who eyes keep watch on the nations. But it's more than that one Exodus story that we are to be joyful about. And verses 8 and 9 praises added on for just keeping us alive in all the little exodus that we personally experience in life's difficulties. We all have them. We've all lived through them. And so the psalmist writes, Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. And Professor Clint McCann, a renowned expert on the psalms in the world, who actually visited us during worship a few months ago, noted that those lines that I just read are about God willing and working for life. And that good professor goes on to point out that given the 
focus on life, it's not surprising that Psalm 66 recalls reverently and joyfully what was for Israel the quintessential and paradigmatic life-giving event, the exodus from Egypt on Pharaoh's death-dealing regime. The Psalms you see wants all of you to grasp that and be moved by the reality of God's exodus-wise actions in life, not just for the Hebrew slaves way back then, but for all those in need of help throughout time. As Professor McCann points out, we need to grasp that, oh, God's characteristic activities is on behalf of those whose lives are most threatened and vulnerable in and the Exodus Bible story is a bold standard example of God's actions for humans in the Judeo-Christian tradition. But it's not just told to recall one incident in history. It's meant to symbolize and to remind us that God extracts humans from trouble over and over again throughout time. Psalm 66 acknowledges that difficulties in life are a part of of the human experience, that they are a part of living in creation that God made. We all know what that means. We all know difficulties. We all have had very hard things to deal with. And the psalmist points out that life comes with troubles and that they test us. But he also notes that they make us stronger and wiser so that we can survive and live. That without the endurance test, we don't Endure. Verses 10 and 12 address the tests of life and creation and the safe place that God brings us to time and time again as we endure them and are rescued from threats and vulnerabilities. The psalmist writes in those verses, For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have tried us as the silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our back. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. You have brought us out to a spacious place. Over and over again, God acts in Bible stories to bring people out of trouble. God acts that way today for people, including me and all of you. God acts exodus-wise, pushing, pulling, prodding us to our best as well as to provide the best for others. For creation, and there's so much awe and wonder and love in that. And besides shouting for joy, the psalmist sets out how else he responds and gives back to God. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, those my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fat. Make an offering of bulls and goats. So the psalmist gives back blessings to God. And he again shows his word when he tells others of the blessings of God, writing, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he was done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished an equity in my heart, the Lord would not have. God has listened. He has given heed to the words of my prayer. And finally, the psalmist finishes up by blessing God for actions and love received. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. And so there it is. We have Psalm 66 setting up the word why we rejoice in the answer we know is awe, a wonder, and love. We're shown in the psalm evidences how he got that answer. Creation is good. Living in it includes difficulties, but God acts exodus wide toward troubles in the lives of those in the Bible and in our lives. God always seeks to act on behalf of those who are threatened and vulnerable. Help them exit those difficulties. And the proper response is for us to grasp that as a blessing and offer blessings.
blessings in return, including offerings and proclamation to the world of our joy and God's good work in this goodly creation toward God's goodly people. And that, of course, is just the word shown for a general answer. I said I wouldn't give out a math test, but I do want to give us some homework. It's not math homework. It's holy homework. Take some time this week to sit in quiet with no electronic gadgets nearby. And prayerfully and carefully try, really try to gain a perspective that allows you to notice how very true it is that creation is Good. Take time to consider how God has worked and is working in your life in an Exodus wise fashion. How has God worked to rescue you and others from troubles? And also make sure to take time to see how and what specifically there is in your life, big and small, that brings awe and wonder and a sense of well being and a desire of well being for creation. And as you do this, ask yourself, is there cause for me to make a joyful noise? And when you find the answer, offer up to God thanks and blessings and court, make that joyful noise. And I hope and pray and I bet that all of us can find many things to be thankful for, whether it is the beauty of creation, kindness, people, love for family, help in time of difficulties or resolution of troubles as well as what we learn from all of that. And let us consider how we can offer blessings back to God. Whatever, whatever detail you answer you come up with doing this homework, be sure it's God soaked and proves beyond a reasonable doubt that you are loved and that you 